This is Amateur Logic, episode 120, for August 15th, 2018. This episode of Amateur Logic is brought to you by MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at mfjenterprises.com. And by ICOM. See how you can get the most out of this contest season with ICOM. Hi, welcome to Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. <laughs> and I'm Emil. And it's good to be back with you again. Yeah. <laughs> Inside joke there. Yeah. Because um, we just did this once with uh, Audi Mills Audio up. So yeah. uh, more flavor for you this time around. Boy, we got a busy show lined up tonight. I am going to be playing with the Raspberry Pi. But I'm not going to be using a little bitty computer to do it with. Oh, yeah? Yep. It's going to be something a little bit different. I didn't realize it was there, but it's been there a little while. Oh, well, that should be interesting. Emil, what are you up to tonight? Well, I'm I'm going to be uh, doing some slices of the pie myself, and uh, i got some useful tools for the shack and uh, for around the house to use with these things. Cool. Yeah, I've seen it. That is neat. What about you, Tom? Wow. It's nothing to do with a Raspberry Pi. But I did, I did, uh, this is my uh, What Did Tommy Do for a Summer Vacation segment. And uh, it's got a little ham radio twist to it. I think some people will be interested in it. Yeah, I think so. That was, you had a good summer vacation. Yeah it, yeah, it was fun. I got to look at some of the photos you took on it. So, uh, so it should be good. Hey, what's yeah. all this good stuff we got lined up Well, here? you know, this stuff, it just, I came in the day and it was cluttering the table. I think we need yeah. to get rid of it. Yeah, this is a fishing rod. So when are we going to? Yeah. Go fishing. Well, we, we couldn't find the reel. <laughs> yeah. Is that what yeah. that is? Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it actually stayed there that time. Of course. Wow. Uh, we're going to be talking about this a little bit later in the show. You know, we've got our 13th anniversary coming up in October. Lucky 13. Lucky 13. Does, does that mean we need to wear the, uh, the Jason masks? Well... It does mean we need a lure to go on the fishing pole. It does. Right? Yeah. Uh, it means we're going to give away a nice radio package here, and we'll be talking about that a little later in the show. If we could shoot the 13th on a Friday the 13th, that would be pretty awesome. Right that there. would be awesome. I don't think it happens that way. I think it's... No. That's too bad. You know, I, I'd have to look at the calendar again. It's close, but I don't think it's on a Friday. I just looked. It's the 14th. It is the 14th. Well, we have to shoot on Thursday the 13th. That doesn't count, though, does it? I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't done emails lately, and I have an email tonight, Tommy. And an email. Me? Well, one of those, too. <laughs> but before we do that, let's mention that any time we're shooting the episode, we've got a chat room going on at the same time. It's at amateurlogic.tv slash chat. You folks watching the live stream here, you can go there and uh, check in, see what's going on with the crew in there. They are poking fun at us and uh, <laughs> throwing spitballs. Out. We don't know what they're doing in there, really. We No, I haven't looked in a few minutes, but I'm sure there's some hijinks going on, and there's usually a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, so, amateurlogic.tv slash chat. Join them in there, and uh, hey, you know, we, we do read out of there occasionally. We do. Well, to my email tonight, this actually, uh, well, it comes from uh, Manuel W4SSB, and he wanted to talk about soldering. But here, here's what he said earlier this year. He bought a, a Hacko soldering iron, mm -hmm. and much to surprise, it doesn't have an auto shutoff. And I don't know that I've ever had a soldering station that had um, auto shutoff in it. 
But he says several times he's left it on in his shop, and uh, one time it was for over three days. Uh, I did that. That's that's not that's not cheap old man compliant there. It's not safe either. <laughs> no, <laughs> neither Raise one. The buzzer. Uh, he said he did some research and ran across several people who had used a, a microcontroller and built them auto shut off. But that seemed to be like a lot of work just to turn off um, the soldering iron. So he did some browsing and on Amazon he ran across a device from Belkin called a Conserve Energy Auto Shut Off Socket. It says it only cost $11 and it seems to be just what he needed. He bought one, tested it out and uh, it works. And he says it works great and can handle up to 1,800 watts. It has a switch to select 30 minutes, 3 hours, or 6 hours. And he thought maybe, you know, some of our viewers would be interested in knowing about that. Well, thanks, Manuel. Yeah, that is a great tip there. And at 11 bucks, I don't know, Emil, does it make the cut? 11, absolutely. Yeah, 11's way under that radar. That's, that's a great tip to save your tip. Because... <laughs> because because I'll be honest, when I went to work for a week, came back and mine was still on, my tip was pretty well toasted. Uh, yeah, you probably needed another tip. Yeah. What ham doesn't like time and weather? I know I've covered this subject a few times now in some of my projects, but uh, I found a uh, pie uh, project on GitHub uh, from a fellow ham who uh, figured out how to make a forecast clock uh, touch display uh, pie project, and I just fell in love with it, so it's a permanent part of the shack. Check it out. Hello, George and Tommy. I wanted to take a, lot, a little bit more time to go into some details about uh, how I created my Raspberry Pi clock. You might be asking yourself, well, what does this have to do with radio? Well, what ham doesn't have a clock or three in the shack, plus um, the fascination with weather and uh, what have you. Well, this Pi is also sending out the alerts from my NWS alert script that I wrote a while back as well, notifying me of possible spotter activation from the uh, local NWS. First off, I'll start by showing you the finished product here. I uh, use this on a little table we have in the house so that you can. Uh, look at it all the time and if you, if you notice it is touch screen this is one of the pies touch seven inch touch screen you touch it you wind up with the uh, local radar maps for uh, the area which you'll see how to uh, program a little bit later you touch it and you wind up back at the clock with the forecast and the smaller versions of those same forecast windows here very small like I said it's a seven inch touch screen from Pi Pies mounted in the back in a little convenient case they have here that holds the whole thing. The site is in zero BELs and it's actually a GitHub site so you can pull it directly to the Pi. And it uh, was created by a fellow ham in zero BEL. Project is Pi Clock if you need to find it at GitHub. And uh, he's got quite a bit of good documentation in here just to get you going does help a little bit if you're familiar with Linux in my case with the Pi uh, but he does have good instructions for those who might not be I found the instructions to be just enough to uh, supplement what I already know about the Pi and Linux in general so uh, like I said it's well written there's quite a bit of documentation here it tells you how to set up uh, several options like an IR remote, some temperature sensors, and um, no audio, no radio audio file playing, and uh, the software itself, how to configure it. Um, there's quite a few options here, um, one of which I'll talk a little bit about here. Uh, there's APIs that can be set up, uh, in fact, to get those maps and to uh, zoom in on your area we'll talk a little bit about that coming up but the documentation is here and it is uh, good enough to get you going so I enjoyed that part of it it's always good to see people I, putting I chose instructions the weather on the ground API to collect <clears throat> the maps and the data 
for the uh, display and uh, they do give you um, a limit and the system itself works well under the calls per day that they allow you so you don't have to pay so, so the free service basically from Weather Underground and like I said earlier the uh, same Pi is also sending me emails about spotter activation if uh, if needed using the script that I wrote in another episode just thought I'd throw that in there because it'll do both gotta love Pi and any modern computer today they're multitasking the display itself <coughs> is the actual Raspberry Pi branded uh, 7 inch touch screen which works great and it's extremely easy to set up <laughs> considering I guess they made it well everything that's needed in the Pi is built in on the 3B that's the one I uh, used to build that project and here's a little bit better look at the uh, case here the actual touch display um, you can see here it has the uh, cutouts for all the uh, ports, the USB ports there, Ethernet HDMI sound and power nice uh, little setup here this is a it's a relatively cheap case for it from what I remember the display itself is inside of that case along with the Pi being mounted on the back and uh, the display cable coming up around here with its two connectors that's all it takes is that little display cable and the two connectors for all of the touch and display to actually work on the Pi so very simple and it's uh, got some standoffs in there the board that is on the back of the display is actually under the, under the Pi and it all just fits nice and neat and just works. I'm going to go ahead and power it up here so you can see it boot up. Uh, the only real customizations I've done if you notice right there the screen is actually upside down until it boots. A little customization they teach you about in the instructions there to flip the screen because of the orientation um, and if you notice here it auto starts um, there's about a 15 second delay and it'll, it'll auto start the uh, Pi clock or you can click on the now button right there and it tells you how to set it up it goes out and gets the data it's all Wi-Fi from the uh, Weather Underground API and also the uh, uh, Weather Underground Google Maps basically via its API and again if you touch on that it brings up a larger display for those weather maps one of them you can you can also manipulate these to be bigger or at different locations um, but I chose the two views that shows the area I'm in and if you touch it again it goes back to the clock you can change this clock instead of being an analog face it can be a digital you can change the backgrounds um, there's all sorts of things you can customize and make it do of course it doesn't have to be on a 7 inch display either you can put it on a big old television or any HDMI compatible uh, device or even screens that will connect to the Pi screen now you may be wondering how I uh, did this image here like I said you can customize the image behind the clock to be whatever you want a picture uh, anything um, and you, you have to work with the size a little bit I went back and forth through uh, my uh, PC and uh, editing software video I mean uh, image editing and uh, made it the right size so that it would fit into that um, area in the clock so you put those files in certain folders which you can see in the instructions um, and voila they wound up as your background so you can customize it to be something you want it to be it doesn't have to be this but I figured I'd have a good amateur logic TV presence in the shack on the, up, on the upper up left hand side of the screen there's a little uh, summary of uh, temperature and humidity and pressure with winds again for your area that you select in that API basically give it GPS coordinates it'll pull the data and on the right hand side of the screen there's a summary of forecasts basically of the upcoming week 
And at the bottom under the uh, clock face is the sunrise, sunset, and phase of the moon. Uh, so pretty neat software uh, you put together here. There are also keyboard shortcuts, but instead of leaving a keyboard plugged into the uh, Pi, I choose to use the uh, VNC software that's written into the uh, Pi so that you can do a few more things like transfer files back and forth see the display remotely over your network um, you just gotta be careful to make sure it's secured keep it updated for those of us who remember uh, VNC from way back in the support days um, so that's the method I choose here but just to demonstrate I'm gonna hit F4 and you can see I, I jumped right out of that uh, thing right back to the terminal exited the uh, Pi Clock software now I can go keep it up to date as well without having to plug a keyboard or mess with the display um, you know you can do your studio app get upgrades and updates here from this uh, network uh, through VNC Emil you got me thinking about what time the storms are gonna be here <laughs> oh man you should not have said that out loud <laughs> we, we, we made it this far come on <laughs> That's a that's a pretty nice project. It um, is, yeah. Yeah, I've I've seen a, a similar one also. I thought about doing, but that that's pretty nice. It's uh it borderlines on the cheap old man compliant though with the display. It does, True. it does, and they were I was getting ribbed for that in the chat room. In fact, and I did splurge on the display. Uh, that's an extremely easy display to hook up to the Pi. Two two wires and a yeah. ribbon cable, and you're done. But it is worth it. It's really good quality. So yeah, yeah, I've seen I those at for, at um, Micro, Micro Center. Center. I, I almost Dallas. bought one last week when I was. Oh yeah. Well, was it Should last have got week? Two week of them, one for each of us. Well, you know, I would have got flack from email for that. So <laughs> I just, I, I, I'm getting flack. They did look nice though, uh -huh. and I may do it yet. You know, I, I knew I could order it, so I didn't have to buy it. Right but it'll, now, so. it'll work on HDMI too. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So. I've uh, I've actually I put it to a bigger display before I chose that one. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I may do that. I've got an extra monitor sitting there. It's an mm -hmm. old uh, DVI, and I've got a DVI to HDMI adapter that works for my Pi. Hmm. I may uh, I may dedicate that thing for that. Something in fact, similar. in his documentation on his uh, <laughs> GitHub site, he actually has uh, people submit examples. And some people are running these things on 50-inch televisions and, you oh. know, what have you on their walls. Because there's there's really extravagant designs and pictures in the backgrounds. Like I said, you can change it from digital mm -hmm. to analog face clocks and then put pictures in between. It's very customizable. Cool. Yeah. That is a neat. And, you know, I thought after seeing that, maybe... Maybe I wouldn't mind having one of these. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. I think I may do one myself. I've, I've got There's, there have been months of anticipation for that segment. Yeah, also. we've been holding it for how many months? Have been? <laughs> two. I, Will it run okay on a Pi 2? Um, I believe so. I think that might be when the project actually started okay. um, for him. And his instructions are written, I don't think, model-specific. I, uh, I bet it will. The Pi 2 is pretty, pretty decent. Yeah, I've got a couple of them I'm not doing anything with, and that that would be a good good yeah, project. Good. Now, if I'm just not too cheap to come off and buy a display, that's. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you you got to pick one or the other, right? If you're going to be cheap, you can be on time, or if <laughs> if you know when I know if you got to have an umbrella or not, you know. I, well, true. <laughs> there you go. But you know, are you actually going to splurge for an umbrella? I think that would be. <laughs> Your question. There. Well, moving right along here, then that was a nice project. Yeah, um, it was. Well, it was yeah. a good one for sure. Yeah, we got a package in the mail recently here, and you know we like to get free packages in the mail. That's usually. one. That's one of my sec that's my Most second favorite thing. Yep, and this came from my friend Tom Applenack. I don't, um, I don't have a photo of him, but we've shown him on the show before. He's he's yeah out. he's 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 a good guy about representing so. Yeah, we've been uh, we've had him on there with the shirts, I think, and yeah. uh, maybe a hat. W A two I V D, and uh, he sent us a little box here, and he said uh, he bought a bunch of Arduino shells when a couple of local radio shacks were closing uh, a few years ago, 
<clears throat> and he's going to relocate and downsize a little bit, and he's in the process of uh, packing up everything to get his house on the market. And he's not going to have any time to play with these, and um, he's trying to purge his junk boxes a little bit. And he says he really enjoys the shows, and uh, he's hoping that we can make better use of these. And he sent us a box of some various uh, shields here uh, for the Arduino. It's a uh, XB shield. He sent us uh, one of those, uh, a couple of the Proto shields here. Yeah. Um, there was an Ethernet shield. Ethernet shield. I think somebody already helped themselves to that one. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I already had a couple of Ethernet <clears throat> shields, so I, I gave that one to you. But the Proto Shield, you know, it's just a, it's a shield kit. It's just a board and, you know, the sockets and things you need just to put it together and gives you a convenient little Proto board on top of yeah, the organ. Yeah, those are there. cool. So uh, thanks for those, Tom. I really uh, appreciate that. We yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, if you remember the Quartz Fest coverage, Tom was one in the picture with uh, Amy and, and Jerry Ellsworth. Yeah. yeah. So that was Tom. Cool. Before this next Tell segment me. here, I think we need to take a little break. Okay. Because th this is going to be pretty good. and We want to have a full momentum when we hit it. All right. Heard it, worked it, logged it. It's time to get the transceiver that's best suited for your lifestyle. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative products. See how you can make the most out of contest season with these transceivers. The competitive edge you've been looking for, raise the bar and hear what others cannot with this flagship HF 50 MHz transceiver, the IC7851. Reciprocal mixing dynamic range, crystal clear local oscillator design, spectrum scope, dual receivers, and digital voice recorder. The IC7610 is the SDR every ham wants and just in time for contesting season. This high-performance SDR has the ability to pick out the faintest signals even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The new ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio that will change the world's definition of a SDR transceiver. RF Direct Sampling 110 RMDR Independent Dual Receiver Dual Digicell IC7300 is changing the way entry-level HF is designed. This high-performance innovative HF transceiver with a compact design will far exceed your expectations. RF Direct Sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. And thanks, ICOM, for being a sponsor of Amateur Logic here. And hey, uh, supporting us here was a great prize yeah, for Absolutely. They always come through with that. Mm -hmm. So, Tommy, lead us into your segment here. Yeah, well, <clears throat> my family and I went on uh, vacation, not, or the 4th of July weekend, actually, we, uh, weekend before, and we were gone through that entire week. We went out to California. You know, I like doing photography and stuff, so we went to. Yosemite, yep. what do you call it? Yosemite. Yosemite. Yeah. <laughs> National Park and uh, Sequoia and all that stuff. While we And then we went down to L.A. And, uh, you know, when we had John Amadeo from mm -hmm. Last Man Standing on with us in Dayton, he said, if you're ever out there, holler at me and I'll show you around. So I did. And I uh, went out there and I got a tour of the Last Man Studio. So that's that's what my segment's about. And so the show cool. is coming back. It's got shows, yeah, it got canceled and it's coming back. And uh, they, the segment will go into a bunch of that. And then we, we'll t discuss a little bit of it at the end. When it's well, over. Let's look at it, Emil. Oh, man, I watched every one of them. That was awesome. Okay, well, we're out here on vacation in California. We stopped by the CBS studio lot here, and we're going to see our friend John Amadeo. Well, hey, hey Tom, good to see you, John. Good to see you, man. Thanks for coming by. Yeah, good to see you. We missed you at, at uh, Dayton this year. I know. I had uh, I had a little something going on that I had to take care of here in uh, Southern California. Yeah, and uh, I guess for those of you that are new to it, John Amadeo is the uh, producer for Last Man mm -hmm. Standing. That's correct. And uh, Last Man Standing is a great comedy show. It's got a uh, good amateur radio uh, <laughs> Twist it has it. it has some amateur radio in it. Yes. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. So we'll take what we can get. That's right. I appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, uh, we were. I hated it when it got canceled. You were going for six seasons. Is that right? We had we just finished our sixth season, and we we thought we would get the seventh. Mm -hmm. 
and unfortunately that didn't work out for us on ABC. But the good news is that uh, our studio, 20th Century Fox, has decided to pick it up and put us on for our season seven. And uh, as you can see behind us, we're just now starting to put the show back together. Yeah, so that's that's what's back here. Some of the walls and uh, the guys are here working on the set. So it's uh, pretty interesting to be here and see yeah. this stuff going on. Yeah, unfortunately, when the show was canceled, um, because of the high cost of storage, we had to dispose of most of our sets and props and wardrobe. So here we are building it all over again, and uh, it's going to be even better when we build it this time. Yeah, so uh, anyway, you'll see some pictures along with this. Uh, we, we took, uh, uh, what do they call them? That's the mill. The mill. There? The mill. Yeah, the okay, mill. Okay, we're building they... some of the walls yeah. and fireplaces and all that cool stuff. That's right. We turned our raw wood into the last man standing set. Yeah, so anyway, very interesting stuff. Cool. Um, it's, it's a great show. It's uh, one of my family's favorite shows. Thank you. Uh, I'm not, honestly, I'm not a big TV watcher. I don't have a lot of time to sit there, but we always DVR that one to watch it, so we never miss Well, we're it. only interested in you watching Last Man Standing, so yeah, it doesn't well, really matter. Yeah, that's pretty much all we watching. In fact, your viewers should just, you know, go to Fox right now and just wait. You just sit there and wait. Yeah. So, actually, when will it start back? September. Um, September, mid-September. Okay. It'll be on Fox now, not ABC, and it will be on Friday nights, which it always was, and it'll be still at 8 o'clock on Friday nights, okay. 7 o'clock Central. Perfect. Yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. Um, we usually shoot uh, Amateur Logic or Ham College during that, so I'll have to uh, You're going to have to move that. You're going to have to move yeah. so, so if we start shooting uh, one of the shows on Saturday, you'll know why. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I know you guys had... Uh, if you hear all the sounds, there's your forklifts and a lot, a lot of construction going on. It's a working, a working studio, and everybody's trying to put it back together right now. So yeah. So uh, you guys had uh, live radios there on set. I'm That's assuming right. you guys are going to have the same stuff going. We will. We're going to have even better stuff uh, this yeah. year. Icom has been nice enough to send us a, an IC7610, which is sitting in my office right now. Yeah, a nice upgrade. Nice, a nice upgrade. And uh, when we get the Mike Baxter set built, that will go on the Mike Baxter uh, radio desk along with an IC5100 for D-Star, for UHF, VHF, and D-Star. Um, you, you can't see it now because it's not up there, but on the roof of this building, and maybe you can get some B-roll later of the building, we'll go uh, probably a 20-meter, 40-meter fan dipole and uh, a Comet GP1 for UHF, VHF, uh, so we can do D-Star and, and have our fans from around the country continue to call us on the stage. Oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, so, so you are going to have the net. Yeah, I, I don't know how much we'll, we'll do. We'll, it depends on the workload. Now, coming back to Fox, it's almost like starting the show over. So initially, it's going to be a lot of work for us. But as we settle back into the rhythm of the show, I'm sure we can allocate some time to put some people on the radio. And we do like having our fans call us. It's been a really fun thing for our crew. We have quite a, quite a lot of licensed crew members and some special guest operators that come and get on the Mike Baxter radio and contact uh, fans from around the country. And, and we've even got some other, uh, some contacts from other countries. Yeah. South America, we certainly hit uh, Japan from here and, uh, you know, up into Canada easily. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's a good place to be. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, how many how many licensed crew members did you have before? You know, well, we've had as many as 35. Now, I can't say because some of the crew will change now. Um, remember, we were canceled last year. So a whole year has elapsed, and um, people have to work for a living, so some of those crew members will probably be on other shows. So I have to kind of get a sense of how many people that are coming back are licensed, and maybe see if anybody new on the show wants to get a license this year. Yeah, of course, I'll, they will be watching Ham College, so they'll have no trouble getting yeah, their license. There you go. It'd be pretty easy after <laughs> this. Yeah. Um, so I guess... Uh, as far as you know, pretty much the same cast coming back. Yeah, we don't know exactly what's going to happen yet because the writers haven't written it yet, and we very much produce what the writers write, and uh, we we hope we expect and hope that the cast will be more or less the same, and the show will look the same, and that the, the way the show is run will be the same. Because I'm going to run it, so um, we expect that the fans will see a very familiar uh, Last Man Standing. So, uh, when do you think you get your antennas up on the roof? Uh, probably, you know, this is uh, this Saturday will be the hottest day of the year. It's going to be like 120 degrees, so that's probably the day I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds good. It's not my uh, buddy in uh, Canada, Mike. You've probably seen him on the show yeah, before. I have, yeah. He always jokes around about waiting until wintertime to do yeah. his antenna. <laughs> it just seems like um, funny to me that for some reason, I usually do it on the weekends because the lot is very quiet and nobody bothers me up there. It turns out to be that I do it on the hottest day of the year. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's kind of 
it's kind of typical. Yeah. yeah. So nothing's really going to stop us anyway. No, I mean, I've been up there a lot. It's a, it's a good location for antennas. It's about 40, maybe more than 40 feet high. The, the stage roof is more or less empty, although there are a lot of solar panels now, so I have to be very careful. I can't really drop a tool and break a solar oh, yeah. panel. And we've uh, mostly had 40 and 20 up there and always something for VHF, UHF. Okay. And that's sort of, and I can't put too much up there because, you know, the studio lot is working. Uh, this is the West Coast home of CBS, so they have a lot of transmission going on uh, live all the time, and I can't interrupt anything oh, that yeah. they're doing. I would probably get thrown off the lot if I did that. So I can um, imagine. You to be careful about that. I can imagine. Um, so you're going to have 5100, you're going to have D-Star? Yep. Um, we always have had... Since the very beginning of Last Man Standing, we've always had D-Star. In fact, we did a, the first radio event we did from this set was a very big D-Star, yeah. where we had uh, the PAPA system, which is a local Southern California repeater system. I remember that. And we did D-Star. Um, it was a, a, full, a full day long of D-Star operation from live from the set. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. That sounds great. Uh, unfortunately, on the shooting days, I think you said they're Tuesday. I'm usually gone, so... Mm -hmm. uh, if you guys uh, do the net and run D-Star, I can check in for that. So well, we could make a point of it, yeah. We, we usually run, we'll, we'll try to find a clear frequency on 20, if 20 is open these days, uh, you know, propagation being what it is. And then uh, sometimes 40 works a little better. We get on the air about uh, 4, 4.30 Southern California time. So that's 5, 6, 7 East Coast. Um, you know, we'll try to see what the best propagation is. And, of course, with the sunspot spike being what it is, you know, it's just going to be whoever can hear us, we'll talk to them, and uh, we can't increase our power because we can't interfere with the operations of the CBS broadcast facility, but uh, we, we work whoever we hear. Yeah, well, that's great. I'll be looking forward to that. Okay, we can check in. Um, just kind of on a side note, does not ham radio. Well, you were telling us about some of the other shows that were produced here on this line. Oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, this stage that we're on right now, which is stage nine, was the home of Seinfeld for many, many years, but also Will and Grace was here. Uh, this before this was uh, a CBS stage. This was Mary Tyler Moore's studio. She owned the studio, so she produced all of the MTM shows, like um, the Mary Tyler Moore Show and Lou Grant and Fra and uh, not Frazier, but um, Rhoda. Rhoda she did, and also Bob Newhart. Uh, so you know, all of the MTM shows were produced here. Uh, so it was unheard of that uh, a small studio like Mary Tyler Moore was able to buy this incredible facility. Yeah, this, and then CBS bought it eventually. Yeah, this is Gilligan's Island too, right? Gilligan's Island was right behind the building that I'm uh, my office building is now. Yeah, that's uh, incredible. I, yeah. I used to race home to see Gilligan's Island after school. Very funny. I mean, you should almost take a shot of it, but it's all just buildings now. They uh, long since filled in the lagoon and built buildings on top of it. And, you know, every square foot of this lot is so valuable that they have to put as many buildings as possible. Yeah. You know. And parking. Parking's the hardest thing here. Yeah, it's it's kind of crazy to me where it is. It's like, it's literally right here in the middle of everything. So I was kind yeah. of surprised to see that, well, that it was necessary. Well, the studio was here first, which is why this is called Studio City. Sure. And then, of course, the housing grew up around it. And now, you know, so it feels like a little island in the middle of this sea of housing. But this was here from the 1920s. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really been an incredible experience. I appreciate you taking time to Oh, it's my pleasure. I, yeah. I watch your guys' show, so least I could do is contribute to it. Yeah, we appreciate it. Uh, I know a lot of people were disappointed that uh, Last Man Standing was canceled before, and we're excited to see it coming back. Well, we're excited to be back, and um, I think our commitment is to bring back the same show, a uh, clean family show that you can watch with your son, you can watch with your grandparents and your children, and everybody's uh, pretty safe to watch our show. Cool. Well, anyway, I really appreciate you taking the no, time. No, thanks for coming out it's here. good to see you we again. We need to come back when we have all the sets up and get on the radio and uh, make some contacts. Oh, yeah, I'd love to do that. Okay. Yeah, Maybe we'll see you at Dayton this year. I think you, you probably 2019 I will be at Dayton. Oh, awesome. I had to get all this done before I could go. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. So, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Tommy. Thanks for coming out here. Well, it was very cool. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad this show's coming back because I wasn't lying. It was, that was honestly was my family's favorite show. We, I never missed any of it, ever. That was like um, like an awesome adventure. It was. It was. It was. Uh, we went on vacation. I saw uh, magnificent sights for using a kind of silly word, but uh, all that stuff. But that was the highlight of the whole vacation, going to that. Wow. It, it was very cool. I, want, um, I probably got a bunch of pictures also. I wanted to kind of flip through and show you okay. my, my picture slideshow here. That's uh, that's some of the stuff where they're setting up the set. Obviously, if you look up at the top, they've got the 
the pipe and chains that they're hanging up there, that's what they're going to hang all those lights we saw yeah. on. So that, it's kind of interesting because they won't leave that stuff up there when they put another show in. They'll hang that stuff down and suspend it by the chains and put the lights on them. I'm thinking we should do that in here. Well, we got a pipe back right there. I mean, what's what's the difference? <laughs> now, I, you know, I used to work in television. It's kind of amazing how tall those ceilings are and how far away that you are from the lights. I guess these days, though, they're probably using LEDs or something. They're not using the, the halogens we used know, to cook the They were pretty big-looking lights, but... Uh, I don't know what the size of the ones you had before. That's uh, that's Mike's office there, and you can see the light, the pipes up there hanging. It's just yep. a nice big grid of it up there. But uh, that's the starting of the office. And this, they had uh, when we were in there, they were putting the bleachers together. If you go and and get tickets and watch the live taping of the show, kind of like you're doing online of us. Mm -hmm. um, this is where you you'll sit there, and and they've got uh, TV monitors. So you can see if you're not in front of the room, they're they're recording, and you can see the basically the show that you're you're seeing over the air, and then the audio speakers here if you can hear. Maybe we need some bleachers too. Yeah, well we got uh, we got two rolling chairs over there. Well, <laughs> two yeah, rolling we, chairs. We have had uh, an audience of two in here before. I we, think we have, but yeah. that was on field day. They and weren't. They were participating also. They didn't seem to be quite as lively as the one no, the last man standing. There. No, and uh, that's the uh, the set with the uh, the high mic and uh, headset there and everything. Just another picture of that. So that's actually the working radio. Yeah. Um, you oh, saw yeah. Laura on there working. Uh, that she was actually working Val from uh, oh. Ham. Yeah, from uh, Ham Nation. That's who she was working in that recording. So. I've actually got the video with the audio that goes with that, and you can hear her on there making her contact. It's pretty cool. And there's the, there are the bleachers. So is the uh, technical crew, the the video switchers, and everything up in the? Yeah, it's all in. It's all in there. The farthest right is got. I think it's the farthest right when the soundboard mm -hmm. is in there. Now you can see the soundboard through the third window, but uh, it, they got a big giant board in there, and that's where the the lady that was on the radio actually works. Um, but then they've got the video camera switchers and all kind of stuff up in there. It's a really cool place. And this was on the lot. This is actually the My Three Sons house. If you used wow. to watch My Three Sons yeah. when you were a kid, well, that's the house. And it's been in a whole bunch of other shows as well. Uh, so you saw the, the picture that showed all the little logos of the other shows that they're doing now. Right. But there's a lot of old ones that were done there as well. Old movies, movies and TV shows. What do you think about all this, Emil? I, I'm thinking I'm I'm agreeing with the chat room. We're we're all going to show up at your uh, place and crash and and we're going to have to upgrade the air conditioner though. We're going to come <laughs> well, watch the show live one day. We will have to. Your... Come on. There wasn't any air conditioning in that building though, was it, Tommy? Uh, I don't know if it was any in there, but it wasn't on when I was in there. But it, it probably it wasn't is. bad. I, yeah. yeah, they would have to, or they'd be sweating. You, in there you know, a lot of buildings out there in Southern California they don't right use air conditioning. Yeah. Them, so. Which just seems like a totally foreign concept to well, me. Well, if you look on those pictures, I think yeah. they showed some AC on the top of the buildings. Yeah. Up there. No, in, all, in all seriousness, no. I, I, I'm just like uh, Tommy in that regard. I watched every one of them. You could watch them online. And I, went, I remember going back after I realized I missed a few just so I could watch them all. It's an awesome show. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I'm, I'm so happy that it came back. Uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine's there. My son... Loves that show. I've watched a few of them. It's pretty funny. Uh, anyway, that was there, so got that picture for him. And uh, they, they have a street there called New York Street. You saw that uh, Seinfeld uh -huh. was filmed there. It, actually, in the same building as Last Man Standing, where that set is. That was the Seinfeld set. But the New York scenes were on the street right here. And that one of those is where the Soup Nazi was. One of those little storefronts oh, wow. right there. <laughs> Um, so all that stuff is, if you saw the outside stuff with the actors on it, this is where you, they shot it on the street. So so you're telling me George Costanza was actually in that building? Right there. Right. Wow. And Kramer, too. Yeah. In a lane. And, and uh, no soup for you. No soup for you. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, looking the other direction. And you can't see it very well, but if you look at the sky, you can see these little wires that are running across. Mm -hmm. And he said uh, those are for if they want to have a night scene 
or rain, they have this, this little scrim thing that'll pull across and it'll darken the street. And they've got sprinklers that'll start dropping water so they can make it night and rainy or whatever. So if a cab, you need a cab to run through and somebody catch a cab in the rain or whatever, yeah. that's that can all be done there. Yeah. And that doesn't happen that much in Southern California. That's what I was thinking. You'd have to wait an awful long time to yeah. catch a rainstorm. It, it's very cool. Uh, this was, uh, the, you see the the My Three Sons house right yeah. there, but the park bench, that's uh, Seinfeld Central Park. If you saw them on the bench in Central Park and stuff, yeah. that's, where, that's where they shot it, right there. Well, it's not as nearly as big a park as no, I thought it was. it's just a small park. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, those guys right there, that uh, our, the yeah. QSL guards survived the, uh, the cut. Um, so uh. they, they lost a lot. But I think he said that uh, Tim Allen kept a little bit of the stuff from his office, and apparently maybe some of this stuff was in with what he had uh, that's not what oh, i understood wow. anyway so well that sure is but, a familiar qso card yeah. there that looks new no yeah. that is new yeah, that's a good look. i don't recall seeing that in the previous no. episodes no <laughs> uh when did you send that one emil oh uh, about two weeks ago um cool. john emailed me maybe when you were there um okay he, he emailed me and i sent them two of them uh got them to him and there's peter too yep absolutely and Can't joe peter joe is carol, carol? Yep. Val's is just to the left of mine right there. See the Wisconsin yeah. thing? To the left of emails is a picture of my radio. You just can't quite see it, though. Yep. So, That's yeah. cool. Yeah. You got the radio set up. They're going to be operating on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, on their dinner break. It'll be around 4 p.m. on the West Coast, 6 Central, or 7 p.m. on the East Coast. So um, they'll, they'll start up, and I guess I'll have the first net uh, this cool. coming Tuesday. And you can can go to Facebook here and the, he, yeah, ask him where, where people can find out where they are and everything and exactly when. And you can go to their uh, Last Man Standing Facebook page right there. And they'll post that post there, and they're also going to post on the next one on DX Summit. DX Summit dot so, five. So keep yeah. an eye on that stuff uh, Tuesday about that time, and hopefully you can make a contact with the the Last Man Standing uh, stage. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was nice, and I, I just want to thank John on here for for uh, he was he yeah, was really awesome yeah. to show us around all that stuff, and he sent the uh, the opening video and the little the jingle and all that stuff and a bunch of stuff to use with with permission of the mm -hmm. studio, so all that stuff's on there with permission. Uh, but anyway, it's really awesome, and uh, yo yo make sure you uh, set your calendars reminders and and watch it when it comes when last man standing comes back on the air well i guess after seeing all this we'll forgive him for not being at dayton this year yeah well he, he was pretty like he was, he was busy. pretty busy yeah. at the time so he said he'd probably make it this coming year though so cool we'll have to watch for him yeah. email it's time for your email emails from emil <laughs> uh, actually we have a uh a google plus uh, post here from my buddy who's in the chat room, uh, Mr. Ralph, AB10OP, uh, sorry. And uh, I'm really not going to focus too much on the content of this more than the spirit of this, which is what I love about ham radio. So so Ralph was doing some work with some, uh, obviously, some USB to serial adapters here on some uh, Arduino projects, it looks like. Um, and... You know, he, he found some problems, and what he had there on his side was a failure to communicate, right? Well, yeah. that didn't stop Ralph. So, no, he, he figured it out. He made it work. He uh, got what he needed, and uh, that's the theme to me. I've been through so many projects where things just didn't quite add up or something wasn't right, and you know what? You stick with it. You make it work, and there's Ralph's uh, project, so... Way to go, Ralph. And that's the spirit right there of projects and making it work. Never give up. That's it. And, and you know, that's the difference between being successful at projects and not is just hanging in there till uh, it's going. Uh, oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. no, nothing's going to go smooth. If, no. if it goes smooth you right overlook the first something. time, you, yeah, yeah, you're not doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. That's nice, Ralph. Well, we're going to take another quick break here. Get a message from... Uh, MFJ, and we'll be right back. Want a multiband HF antenna with real gain and a low profile package that will have your pocketbook and your neighbor smiling? Then the new MFJ hex beam antennas are for you. 
The MFJ 1846 is a six-span hex beam with just an 11-foot turning ratio covering the 20, 17, 15, 12, 10, and 6-meter bands. The MFJ 1848 8-band hex beam adds 40 and 30 meters in a 14-foot turning ratio. Both antennas use an updated G3TXQ element configuration for improved bandwidth, superior front-to-back performance, and low SWR. But that's just the beginning. MFJ takes a hex beam's unique balance tension framework to a new level with rugged mounting hardware, exceptionally durable fiberglass spreaders, and sliding antenna wire guides. All designed to ensure years of reliable service in tough 21st century weather conditions. And with their lightweight and low wind loading, these antennas can be mounted using lightweight TV masts, tripods, gable mounts, or even chimney straps. And they can be rotated with inexpensive rotators. Both antennas handle maximum legal power for all modes on all covered bands. Gain and directivity make all the difference when hunting DX or maintaining schedules, and hex beams have a long history of delivering satisfying results where antenna options are limited. It's no secret that these antennas are expensive for small companies to manufacture. MFJ's massive purchasing power and extensive manufacturing capabilities kick in to your advantage. You'll get more antenna for less money when you order a MFJ hex beam. Choose a compact antenna with 5.3 dBi of gain and a front-to-back ratio of 15 to 20 dB. Choose MFJ's 1846 or 1848 hex beam for your next antenna. Get all the details. Visit MFJEnterprises.com today. I promised a little earlier that uh, I was going to show you playing with the Raspberry Pi, but I wasn't going to use a Raspberry Pi. Yep. Well, here's what I did. I was playing around with my Raspberry Pi this afternoon, and I thought, well, let's see if there's any updates. And I just did these the other day, so I'm thinking, uh, maybe not. What's this down here at the bottom, this little white object? I don't recall seeing that before. Hmm. Well, maybe I'm not on the Raspberry Pi at all. Maybe I'm on my Windows machine, and I'm running the Raspberry Pi in a virtual machine. If you go to the raspberrypi.org website, and you click on Downloads, you may notice something uh, a little bit different down there. Of course, there's the regular Raspbian downloads right there, the Noobs version, and uh, straight out Raspbian. But right below that, Raspberry Pi Desktop for PC and Mac. It's Debian Linux with Raspberry Pi Desktop, the Foundation's primary operating system, and they're offering it right here. You can run it as a live disk or in a virtual machine or even install it on your computer. But we got to check this out. I'm a long time user of VirtualBox, so I already had it installed on my system. I just went in and updated to the latest version. You can see I've got two virtual machines on here as it sits. I have an old Windows XP machine because sometimes I need to run software that runs only on XP. And I've also got uh, imported Windows 7 32-bit version here that uh, it was just on an old hard drive I had here. I'd, I sometimes wanted to run things on Windows that I could destroy afterwards and putting it in a virtual machine like this made that real easy to do. So now we're going to install the Raspberry Pi desktop on my Windows PC. There's a number of steps involved in this and it's a little too much to show in the video here. So I'm going to point you to a link that gives you all the details you need to know to download and install both VirtualBox and the Raspberry Pi desktop. Okay, we followed the steps now and Raspberry Pi desktop is booting. We've got a few steps to go through here, not unlike setting up the Raspbian operating system on a Raspberry Pi itself, which uses the country, time zones, and a few other options. There's Raspberry Pi Desktop. The window looks a little small, so we're going to need to install the guest editions for VirtualBox. I found this step a little confusing, but a little research and following a couple more links here, we finally got it going. Here's what I had to do. And at last, it took a little bit to get going. I originally started with info from the Pi.io website, and I couldn't get the Linux window here full screen in the virtual machine. 
And that led me to aoakley.com as well as neotribe.co.uk. And I followed the information there for installing the guest editions, which allow you to better integrate with the hardware on your PC. And now I've got it going full screen. It took a little doing. Let me show you the, well, I did everything on all those sites. But let me show you what actually helped make it work here. I went to virtual screen number one, and it seemed like I was just stuck here at 800 by 600, even after I'd gone through all these steps. I found out what I really needed to do is come down here and click on resize to the size that I wanted, which in this case was 1920 by 1080, and it didn't resize the screen automatically. What I needed to do after choosing that was to enter a command to shut down the Raspberry Pi, sudo shut down minus R now. I enter that command and it'll reboot the Raspberry Pi. And when it comes back up, it'll be in the resolution that you chose from then on. So uh, that was the one trick after going through everything else that I found helped here. It's kind of misleading that when I chose a new resolution, it didn't automatically take effect. So here we go. It's the Raspberry Pi desktop. Now, it's not really the Raspberry Pi operating system here, but it's a parent of it. It's the Debian Linux operating system. And we're using a Raspberry Pi desktop on here, so it looks like a Raspberry Pi here. And for most intents and purposes, it operates like it. Now you can see I installed uh, one extra utility here I like to install on all my Raspberry Pi machines, Midnight Commander, which is sort of like the old Norton Commander, if you ran DOS on a PC back in the day. Now this is kind of handy, it's an option. There might be some other software that I install in here, I haven't decided yet. There's a, a, a lot to explore here, and I didn't have Linux running on my machine already, so now I do, and I'm looking forward to doing a little something with it. Now, if I need to get back to Windows 10, it's simple enough. I can either minimize this, just to get it out of the way temporarily, or I can take it down to a smaller window to have my Windows desktop here in the background, or I can exit it. Now, when you go to exit, it's going to do something interesting there. You need to know about you can save the state of the machine as it was when you were using it here. Or you can just send a shutdown signal or power off the hardware. If you save the machine state, then it's going to come back with whatever applications and settings that you had made when you left. And there it is. We're back at the Windows desktop now. If we decide we need to run the Raspbian desktop again, we just bring up VirtualBox here. Choose Raspbian, click Start, and in just moments, we're back exactly where we left off with our Linux machine here. Let's explore a Raspberry Pi desktop on a PC here just a little bit further. At first glance, I mean, it looks identical to the Raspbian operating system. If we look under the menu here, we see virtually the same things that we'd see on a regular Raspberry Pi. All the programming tools here, the LibreOffice and its various components. It has a Chromium web browser, uh, Python games, the usual accessories, Midnight Commander. I added that. You know, that's that's just something I like to have. Uh, your help files, preferences, uh, the run command. You know, this looks just like a Raspberry Pi. As far as GPIO, there are no GPIO ports available on a PC, but I understand that you can connect this with a Raspberry Pi and use the GPIO pins on a Raspberry Pi itself. I didn't look into any details on that. I just read somewhere that that was possible. So I hope you get some use out of this. Looks like it's going to be quite interesting. You're right, that is quite interesting. It was. It it was kind of fun, too, you know. It, I felt just like I was, you know, at my Raspberry Pi. Yeah, well, when I was watching that, I was just thinking, like, 
people that are a little bit nervous about putting Linux on their desktop computer, but they've pl t played around with the Pies. That's the same experience, essentially. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, practically the same thing, isn't it, Emil? With more horsepower. You know, yeah, I mean, George, I got to ask you, though, is, is virtual Pi as good as physical Pi? Uh, as long as you don't need GPIO ports. <laughs> yeah, as long as you don't Good look point. under the covers, email you is never know the as, difference. Is it just as All tasty? Right. Just as tasty, yep. <laughs> and really, just as fast. Maybe a little bit faster. I don't know, it but probably that. is yeah. faster. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, using uh, VirtualBox there, you can add additional operating systems to your machine, and mm -hmm. uh, most newer PCs actually the the hardware. It's designed to be able to take advantage of virtual machines like that. Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, absolutely. It, it's amazing how fast it runs. You would think uh, doing something like that would would really be slow, but no. I mean, you hardly no. notice. Well, it. that's how I actually operate uh, every day at my job. Mm -hmm. They gave me a MacBook Pro. They gave the people that needed more a higher end computer. So they gave us MacBook Pros, but I write code for Windows. Yeah. So I had to put a it was, I'm not using VirtualBox. I'm using uh, VMware Fusion. Mm -hmm. But it's it's really fast. I mean, I just fire it up, and it takes over the computer, and I just do my thing yep. and uh, still use the Mac stuff in the background. Same principle. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to some projects that I can share between a Pi and a Raspberry Pi desktop on my PC. I think it's time for your email. Well, it's I not do, really an email. Yeah, this is the... No, it's not an email. It's a post, and it's the best post ever because it didn't even have any text in it. It was a URL, so mine is HTTP colon. Wait a minute. That's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it actually was just a URL. This is from yeah. uh, Ken Nowinski posted it in there, W2REZ. Where was it posted? Facebook. Facebook? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, we've... I hated to let it go by because I wasn't aware of this, Um and we've covered all the other Radio Shack stuff, mm -hmm. so I thought I'd kind of make sure we brought it up. But uh, the Radio Shack looks to make a comeback with the Hobbytown deal. And uh, I'll, just to summarize it, uh, they've got a deal with Hobbytown USA. To uh, 50 stores are going to start out with a little small section inside the store. I think they said 500 square feet. Yeah, right. So it's, uh, and it, you know, if it's successful, it'll expand into 100 more so. Radio Shack uh, filed for bankruptcy, but they never did really go completely under. No, I mean, and, uh, well, somebody, I don't know who ended up with it, but uh, there's still a website. Yeah, well, now they've, uh, they're have they trying to make a little bit of a comeback again. So they're, they're down, but not totally out. I would, say, I would see this as potentially being able to work yeah, where the other deals would It wouldn't. possibly could because uh, they they're not going to have this whole storefront right. cost and all that overhead. So. You know, um, you know, maybe there's a little bit of hope that we'll be able to get parts at some local places. As long as they stay away from the cell phones and just stick with, you yeah, know, their VC core. And VCRs. Yep. Please don't go into the VCR market. I don't think they'll do that. Yeah, well, you yeah. never know. Well, true. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, thanks for sharing that with us, Ken. Yeah, that is, that really is interesting. Well... Let's come back and talk about these prizes here. We're going to have to give this stuff away sooner or later anyway. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, but we'll be back in just a second and uh, tell you all about them. At the end of each month, it's Amateur Logic's Ham College, the new show for those new to the hobby and those wanting to get into amateur radio. Which of the following is a purpose of the amateur radio service as stated in the FCC rules and regulations? That inductor and capacitor form a tuned circuit. That's how you tune the radio to the frequency that you want. The English language. We lived in town. I liked it. I, I listened to mine a lot. It was really cool because you didn't have to have a battery to power yeah. it. There's our homemade telegraph station. We can use it for long distance communications. Oh, like, uh, what, three feet yeah, here? across the table. The answer is B. Voltage was named after Italian physicist Alessandro Volta. We can see we're generating a little bit of electricity there. It's DC. It's always great to go back and get a refresher. It well, sure is. A lot of that stuff, if you've been a ham for a while like we have, you, you don't really think about a lot of that stuff 
but often. They didn't have electric screwdrivers in those days, so that's why we're not using ones. That's why we went stress. primitive with it. Yeah. So let's see if we can hear anything when we uh, we fire off our spark gap transmitter. Oh yeah. Well, we didn't build anything or blow up anything today, but uh, the night's still young. That's a mighty nice t-shirt you got on it there, is. Tommy. This is my uh, Last Man Standing Ham Radio Club shirt. And I would ask you where can you get one, but I don't think you can. I think those were a limited edition yeah, printing. Yeah, limited. I don't think they're available. Yeah, because I can't find mine. I looked all over so before the even show get Even more limited than you thought they were, aren't Yeah, they? and I just worn it like mm, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I, It'll turn up. It'll turn up somewhere. But speaking of fine clothing apparel... We have some. See how smooth that was? You, that was good. You, you're good. <laughs> uh, you can get all your Amateur Logic swag and Ham College swag at amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com. What have we got on there? Well, we've got uh, hats, sweatshirts. I wouldn't recommend the sweatshirts no. right now, but uh, coming up pretty soon, you may want to start looking into those. Get your swag right there. If you're going to the Huntsville Ham Fest this coming weekend, wear your swag out there. Yeah, and uh, let's get some pictures with you guys so we can show them on the show. Yeah. Radios, headsets, microphones, antennas. Oh, man. Co it says it all. It says it all. Great stuff. And we want to... Uh, we want to celebrate our 13th anniversary here. You know, I've been watching the show ever since the beginning. You yeah, have? Yeah. You're the one. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. My mom my mom just loved to watch it. So oh, yeah. Was, my mom still watches it every now and then. Does she really? See, yeah. Sometimes. Oh, wow. I, I was kidding about my mom. She I don't think she would have watched it. Oh, mine, mine did. She said, I don't know what y'all are talking about, but, yeah. you know. Looks like y'all are having fun. We anyway. Are. We are. That's why I'm, it's been 13 years. Yep. So we want to celebrate again in a big way. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, ICOM, MFJ, Howl Sound, and Gordon West Radio Schools. We've got together a nice radio package and just, we got all this together just like, like that. Just like that. I mean, the, the Howl Sound stuff just showed up like just before showtime. Just like night. that. Just like, yeah. Well, something like that. Something like just that. Just something like that. Yeah. The email was kind of like, was that a Mexican dance that you were doing there? Yeah. <laughs> the ICOM IC7300. We've given those away here before. It's a great radio. We've used them at Field Day. It's, uh, of course, a software-defined radio. It's got RF direct sampling. And you know what that means is the RF signal is directly converted into digital data. And that's done with field programmable gate arrays, and it makes it possible where they can construct simple circuits and then do the, the noise reduction and mask out noise without masking out weak signals. So it, it allows them to do better filtering since it's being done in the digital domain instead of the analog domain. Uh, it's got great DSP noise reduction in it. Uh, RMDR and phase noise characteristics are great. The RMDR is about 97 dB. Superior phase noise reduces noise components for both receive and transmit signals. 15 discrete bandpass filters that help the, the signals pass through and uh, kind of filter out stuff on outsides of the pass band. And that reduces insertion loss. And the IC7300 uses high Q factor coils, so for tight tuning. A real-time spectrum scope, built-in automatic antenna tuner, 101 memory channels, SD memory card slot for saving data, a multifunction meter, CW functions like full break-in, CW reverse, CW auto tuning. Uh, of course, it uh, does SSB, CW ready, AM, and FM modes. IC7300 is uh, a great transceiver, especially at the price, man. Those, those things are really popular now. Probably, I, I would say without doubt, probably one of the best lower cost HF transceivers oh, available yeah. now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you can't beat it for what you get for no. your money. It is absolutely amazing. Yeah. The audio, the audio on the thing is fantastic. Well... Yeah, it is. You know, I've got 
an IC7700, which is considerably up the line from this one. And that, that sounds, mm. you wouldn't know the difference hardly. Yeah. I mean, they, they sound so close. Now, of course, there is some difference between, you know, a radio in this price point and, and uh, say, a flagship radio. But the difference is, has narrowed considerably with the introduction mm. of this one. So we're going to give away that. Uh, we've got other stuff to go with it, though. If you if you ever get used to using one with the band scope, oh, you can't hardly go back. Yeah, and yeah. and you have to send the loaner one back. <laughs> that was that was pretty painful, wasn't it's, it's, it? Yeah, it's traumatic. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to need an antenna for that. What have we got in well, the way we, of antenna there? And uh, compliments of our friends at MFJ. We've got the MFJ 2286 portable big stick HF antenna. Covers 7 to 55 megahertz. Can handle up to 1 kilowatt of power. It's got a 17 foot telescopic stainless steel width that collapsed to just 28 inches in seconds. Adjustable high Q air wound coil. And it includes uh, MFJ 342T pipe mount and counterpoise kit. Super easy to set up, and I've made quite a few contacts with it. Now, you use the Big Ear. It's two of these, mm -hmm. right? And this one is called the Big Stick. Yeah, the Big Stick. And uh, it's essentially half of the Big Ear, except it includes a ground counterpoise as well. Oh, okay. So that, that's, that's what does the other uh, half of the element here. Uh, great antenna, 17 feet, you know. 17 feet, that's what Vince had on the back of his car. Yeah. <laughs> for a field day last year. Yeah. It was quite impressive to see on a small car like as that. As long as he didn't back out under the electric lines, <laughs> we were good. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, extremely compact antenna here and good performance, too. Mm -hmm. You know, this will go, uh, what, is it 40 meters on through six? Is that uh, what it yep. does? Yep, absolutely. So, um, great antenna there from MFJ uh, for, for portable operation. It would be hard to beat how quick you can set that up and get going. Yeah, it's uh, it's a good one. Uh, we've also got well the Howl ICM microphone from Howl Sound. That's this right here. If my lovely hand model can reach it, what you'll do since the lovely hand model is not here. Well. There you go. If I don't knock the antenna off. <laughs> Lovely hand models. Yes. Uh, it's <laughs> nice, Tommy. Nice. Yes. <laughs> it's a Howl ICM. It's a lightweight uh, microphone, high performance, specifically designed for owners of earlier ICOM transceivers that exhibit low gain in the microphone amplifier stages. It's not a cheap electric microphone. The ICM utilizes a high-quality condenser element with a broad frequency response of 35 hertz to 12 kilohertz and high output that's crafted for compatibility with uh, those uh, earlier ICOM rigs. Uh, there's a push-to-talk button built right there on it. It comes with the connector all ready to fit ICOM rigs and of course there's uh, another jack here where you can plug in a push to talk button external of it or a foot switch, whatever you'd like. Hall ICM, specially made for ICOM rigs. I want this. feels uh, it's nice and substantial. It is. It's got a little, little heft to it. Yeah. And also from Hall Sound, we've got the new Hall BM17 headset models, if my head model will show that off here. The new Heil BM-17 is a lightweight emergency communications headset. It's available with either the BM-17 dynamic element or the BM-17 IC electric element. The speakers used are the BM-17 are very sensitive, don't require much AF drive from the transceiver. The frequency response of the speakers is 200 hertz to 5 kilohertz with very low distortion. The ear pads are replaceable acoustic foam. And the BM-17 is a lightweight headset designed for emergency communications. And it's available in either a single side or a double side model. Oh, yeah? So it's nice and light. I don't think you'd notice this was on there. Like, I don't think you would either. It's almost nothing. 
Yeah, talking about emergency communications, they nailed it with the color there, didn't they? They did. You won't lose it, but I like that. Yeah. So we're going to have both the uh, the Heil ICM microphone and the new Heil BM17 headset. So you take your choice. Yeah, uh, depending nice. on how very you want to operate that particular time. It's very nice. And more prizes. Well, you're going to need a power supply for that radio. So what are we doing there, Tommy? Well. We just so happen to have one. We've got the MFJ 4230 MVP. Super compact, 30 amp, mighty light switching power supply. It's got a digital voltmeter and ammeter, five-way binding posts, a pair of Anderson power poles, 25 amps continuous and 30 amps surge at 13.8 volts DC. It's adjustable from four to 16 volts and you can choose uh, 120 to 240 at 47 to 63 hertz to take it with you anywhere in the U.S. and abroad. And that is a nice little power supply. As a matter of fact, the, the one we're giving away is still in the box. This one is mine. Yeah. I, I use that for field day anytime I need a good little 12 volt power supply. Yeah, and it's, those, very, it's very nice. Yeah, those, those are nice supplies there. Uh, we're going to need some coax to go with that antenna so we've got 50 feet of mfj us made rg8x coax here with the pl259s already installed on it perfect for hooking between the rig and the big stick antenna here and just in case you, you know you may not be a general yet or you may be wanting to upgrade from general to extra we're also going to include at no additional charge the Gordon West Radio School, your choice of the general or extra exam manuals. Uh, it's courtesy of Gordon West Radio School, uh, WB6NOA, and he teamed up with Eric P. Nickel, KL7AJ, and they cover all the topics and questions that you're going to need to pass your exam with confidence. Hey, hey Tommy. Hey. Ho hold them under my picture. I, w I want to get in on this action. Okay. Put it, put them right like right under my pick. I'm scared to show them the front cover there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Even more better, except of course this one's a transparent one. Yeah. <laughs> the one you got won't be transparent. Yeah. That's a special wait, 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 edition. Wait, wait, Oops. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't, sorry, we didn't mean to leave you out. Of yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I was going to send you some of this stuff to read too, Emil, but uh, we just didn't get that far with it. We're going to have a few qualifications here. Let's go over those. You mean there are rules? There are rules to this contest. First, how would you become qualified? Well, you got to be a licensed U.S. or Canadian amateur radio operator with a U.S. or Canadian shipping address. And once I find my piece of paper here, you only one entry per contestant. Sending more than one entry will disqualify the applicant. So please don't do that. Yeah, please don't. And the winner is responsible for any taxes incurred. And I, I do want to reiterate what you said there, Tommy, because in the past we've had some people enter more than once, and they were disqualified. Yeah, so. we have. So please don't don't do that. If yeah. if you enter. You'll get an uh, autoresponder email mm -hmm. back. Check your spam folder and make sure uh, it didn't get picked up by your spam filter. Yeah. And if you still don't get it after a little while, let us know and we can check it for you. Yeah. So pl please don't uh, re-enter and get yourself disqualified. We'll be glad to check it for you. The winner agrees to the use of his or her call sign and name in promotional and news items related to the contest. And contestants must not be employees or affiliates of Amateur Logic, ICOM, MFJ Enterprises, Heil Sound, Gordon West Radio School, or Emails Cat. <laughs> uh, you can't win. You might ask, how do you enter? How, how would you how enter? How do you enter? How would you enter, Emil? I'm thinking you could enter via email. You need to go to the website shown there, amateurlogic.tv slash contest, and you'll get all the official rules. But on that email, we're going to ask that you only put your call sign in the subject line. If you put anything else in there, it's not going to be filtered properly, and uh, 
you probably won't get entered. Include your name, call sign, class of license, and address in the email message. Submissions must be made between Saturday, August 11th, and Thursday, October the 11th of 2018. And how are we going to choose a winner here? Well, the same way we did the last uh, however many years we've done this. The contest winner will be selected by a random number from the entries received. The winner will be announced on the October 15th episode of Amateur Logic TV. And if it's determined that the winning entry doesn't meet the qualification requirements, another winner will be chosen by the same method. Get all the contest rules and information. It's posted right now, amateurlogic.tv slash contest. Go there before you enter. It, it, right at the bottom there, you'll see all the qualifications and uh, rules for the contest. Make sure you get your entry in uh, before October the 11th and that you get it in correctly, but only one time, please. Fun show tonight. A lot of good topics, I thought. Yeah, it was great. Uh, a lot of good stuff. Uh, the segments were pretty good, I thought. Mm -hmm. Actually, they were very good. Yep. So I enjoyed it. 73, good luck in the contest. Yes, good luck in the contest. <laughs> You're five nine. Good one, Tommy. I, I saw what you did there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, on the way out the door here, a couple of things to mention. What would be the first thing we normally mention here, Emil? On the way out? Yeah. I'm thinking it's something to do with all the ways you can really get a hold of us and see what's going on in the communities that we have. Yep. Like, uh, like Facebook, Google+, Twitter. What yep. else we got? You're right on target. That's pretty much that's, it. That's, yeah. that's all the ways to get a hold of us. Yep. And, uh, you know, we well, tonight is an example. We had two things there that came out of, I guess yours came out of the Facebook group. No, yours came off the Google Plus group community. Yeah. Tommy right. got one off Facebook. And I got one from email. You know, we still do email, too. Yeah, but you know, it's it's kind of funny because the emails, I still get some, but uh, they're not as many emails, but the posts on the, the stuff on the social stuff is kind of picked up because people seem to kind of move over that stuff yeah. a lot. Yeah, we'll, we'll take either one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, one other thing, and what is that, Tommy? The wiki. The thing wiki is the thing. It's the last thing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like the way that just kinda of like rolled right yeah. off your tongue there. Yeah. No 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 prompting at all. Um anyway, come to check out the wiki. It's at amateurlogic.tv forward slash wiki. Um if you need to know about what's in some of the segments or some of the episodes, go search there and find it. Mm -hmm. And we want to thank our friend Dan, what's his call sign? N9LVS. N9LVS. Appreciate you doing the wiki every month, Dan. They do a great job, and we really appreciate you. Yep. And if you wanted to watch Amateur Logic, well, obviously you found some way to do it. That is, unless you're listening to the audio podcast version. But to watch it, uh, where could you do that? You can do it in a, num in a number of places. Uh, YouTube, mm -hmm. Roku. You can go yep. straight to the website and download the episodes directly and watch them mm -hmm. offline somewhere. Are do, you do like Arnie and watch them on the cruise ship? Or you could subscribe at iTunes. You can subscribe you can at iTunes. Well. We have uh, Amateur Logic and Ham College in there, mm -hmm. so uh, that's a good way to do it as well. Okay. Which, which by the way, George and Tommy, your uh, <laughs> the MP4 formats that you have direct. They work very well on both the Pi 3 and 3B Plus, or 3B and 3B Plus. That that was like the um, the wa high watermark that we were shooting for with them. <laughs> so. It works very good at the last couple of hand fests, the one in Lafayette and uh, the, the one we just had here at W5SLA. I had the uh, displays going. I saw the photos Finally, of it. Finally, it was a success. Yep. <laughs> All right, before we get out of here, any final words, Tommy? Nope. Uh, be sure to set your calendars for Last Man Standing and uh, watch out with this Tuesday for those posts and maybe uh, make a contact there. That should be fun. Yep. Should be. I'm going to try it myself. Yep. Email? All right. I guess the final words I'll have is uh, stay cool and uh, keep your finals cool. Okay. <laughs> 
Now, does it hurt, though, if you walk by that clock and it's showing that the temperature is extremely high? <laughs> it's a... Uh... It definitely is a, a warning whether or not you want to turn the knob or not, since it's sitting right by the front door. True. <laughs> okay. It's a good place to put it. Yep. All right. And for me, I'm just going to say uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Fun show. Next month, we don't know what we're doing, but we didn't this month either when we yeah. started out. I'm not so. even sure what we did. <laughs> now that you mention it. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone, over in the chat room, those of you watching live as well, and uh, those of you who've downloaded the shows. Yeah, we appreciate you guys hanging with us for almost 13 almost years. 13 years. 7-3, everybody. Good night. 7-3. 7-3. Well, here's what I did. No, that's not what I did. What did you do? What did you do? <laughs> I don't know, that but that's cool. an arrow. Talking about for commuters. Uh, talking about a murder. <laughs> I can't talk.